So today I would love to give you a guide to blockchain and to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies overall. This is meant to be a primer because in my experience, many people confuse a lot of different topics. And what I like to say is if you're conflating whether or not the price of Bitcoin is going to go up with whether or not governments are actually going to allow cryptocurrencies to exist, with whether or not ICOs are going to replace venture capital, and whether governments themselves will exist in the future, all of these topics conflated together cause people to not really have compelling arguments. So what I'd like to do is paint for you a picture of how the technologies work, who the parties are who have an interest in what the outcome is, and why they may hold the views they do. If you look here, we have a combination of incumbents. Incumbents might be governments. Incumbents might be venture capitalists. It might be banks. Now, sometimes they have a vested interest in protecting existing order, sometimes protecting existing orders for a reason. You may not want terrorists to be able to do anonymous transactions, for example. So incumbents have a point of view. Disruptors, technologists who want to change how the world looks in the future will also have a different kind of view. Or whether or not you have a crypto fund that might gain financially from the outcome of this, you certainly have a vested interest. And then there's what I would call the anti-authoritarianism. And I'm not going to say they're wrong. It's just a different outlook on the world. They believe that the less influence that government has over decisions, the better overall society will function. And they have some compelling arguments and some less compelling arguments. But when you can begin to look at the lens of how people view the world of cryptocurrency, you can begin to understand at least where they're coming from in their arguments. Let me start with what is Bitcoin? What actually is Bitcoin? Well, let's look back to how and when and why it was created. Bitcoin really emerged in 2008, and it emerged because that was the peak of the financial collapse. We had just come off of Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. Everyone was concerned global economic order was going to be disrupted. And people were also worried that banks were going to take a lot of our personal money and governments were going to create inflation that was going to devalue our currency. So people were really interested in finding an alternate uh, currency, an alternate way to store their value. And Bitcoin was that. It came from Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, which is not a person who's known. So whether he or she will ever be discovered, we don't know. But it came from 2008. By 2013, you had really seen two separate concepts. You had blockchain and Bitcoin. So you had the currency and the database beneath it. And the important thing about that is as people started to think about the database independent from the currency, they started to realize there are other things you could do with these databases. And the first big one to capture people's attention is Ethereum. And that came out in 2014. And what's different is that Ethereum was really designed as a way for software to interact with software. And the term they use for that is called smart contracts. The idea is I could use software to encapsulate a set of rules that could interact with other software without a central system having to intervene. And we're gonna cover a lot of that today, but that's really the concept you need to understand. Bitcoin itself became less of a place where people assume you do transactions. So there's not a lot of trading in Bitcoin. There's not a lot of people going out and buying things with Bitcoin. But Bitcoin itself has become somewhat of a store of value. So you can think of Bitcoin, at least in 2018, as more as an alternate to gold and less as a transaction platform. By 2015, 2016, the first big software smart contract on Ethereum started becoming really popular, which was a mechanism to do something called an ICO. ICO stood for Initial Coin Offering. And what it really meant was companies creating software that wanted to raise money for their projects could do it using Ethereum. 
and raising money in cryptocurrency directly, often transferred from Bitcoin to Ethereum and then Ethereum to their ICO. So that's really been the first big use case. There may be many use cases on Ethereum in the future. That's the one that really took off. 2017 until the present is a lot of people now believing they can build a better Ethereum itself. So there's a lot of people now trying to create these new platforms where people can create software that interacts with each other. You have Stellar, Tezos, Stratus, there's many others, and we will see if any of those take hold. So when you begin to think about this really complex, amorphous topic of currency and decentralized web and blockchains, I try to encourage people to think about it in three buckets that are layered in a one through three layer stack that are related, but not all the same concept. If you think about blockchain at the bottom as a data model, a database, a way of storing information, currency, cryptocurrency or tokens as something that is how you economically incentivize people to participate in the databases. And above that is a concept called an ICO, which is how people raise money. Those are three related topics. They're not all the same, and we're gonna cover some of that today. To understand better the infrastructure, you need to start by thinking about peer-to-peer -peer networks. You'll hear people call them P2P, peer-to-peer -peer networks. And probably the best ones that you remember are things like Napster or BitTorrent or Skype. And what they are, if you look at the screen, is it's a representation of what people call a mesh network because people have computing resources that are all talking to each other without necessarily a central controlling mechanism. But here's the problem. In the early days of the emergence of P2P networks, people could take music or they could take video or an image or articles and they could spread them all across the internet and therefore people could consume media without ever paying for it. Now this works, people don't like it, but it works in a world in which you're talking about video or music. But how could you create a world in which you're passing money in a peer-to-peer -peer network unless you could guarantee that you only had one copy? Because otherwise you run into a problem that our industry calls the double spend problem. If I could take a cyber asset and spend it twice. And that's really at the heart of what the industry has tried to solve. So the goal of blockchains, number one is to make each digital asset uniquely identifiable. And the way they do this is through cryptography. And I'm gonna explain tip, uh, cryptography to you in a moment. You have to create a record so that we understand what transactions have actually taken place this is stored in what people call a ledger. They, the goal of any of these blockchains is to do it without a central authority who makes the decisions about what gets stored in the database. So it's what people refer to as decentralized. And finally, you need a way of forming consensus across all of these computer resources that decide which transactions are valid and which ones aren't. So let me start with the basics of cryptography. If you look at the top of the screen, you'll see a long string of transaction data. That's what that long block represents. I can run that through an algorithm, a computer algorithm, and out of the other side of that algorithm pops output. And that output is much shorter and it's a fixed length. And that's what people refer to when they say hash. A hash is taking a really long data string, it can be incredibly long, running it through an algorithm that produces a hash, a shorter representation of that data on the other side. And the important thing about running long sequences of data through an algorithm and producing a hash is if I take three separate computers with the same long strings of data and run it through the same algorithm, I will get the same hash every single time. And what's important about that is a concept called verification. If I want to verify that three different computers have the same exact data set and I run them through an algorithm and compare the hash, I can guarantee that nothing has been changed in that data. 
The second important concept for you to understand is if I take data A and data B, and let's say it's a paragraph, and let's say it's 200 characters in the paragraph, and the only thing different between data A and data B is that data B has a period or a full stop at the end. Even changing one thing in a 200 character sequence will produce a different hash. So that's important. If I run two different data sets through an algorithm and I get two different hashes, I know for sure that they're not the same data. And the third important thing about the uh, structure of cryptography is that if I have a hash, I can't reverse engineer it. I can't take a hash, run it reverse through an algorithm and figure out what the underlying data says. And that's important because that's how you guarantee security and anonymity of the data and the transactions. So if I take a transaction, if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see Bob sent 0.5 Bitcoin to Mary who received 0.5 Bitcoin. I run that through an algorithm. In the case of Bitcoin, the algorithm that's most commonly used is called SHA-256. SHA just stands for Secure Hashing Algorithm, SHA-256, which I'll just refer to it as SHA-256 from now. And I produce a hash, hash A. I have a separate, unrelated transaction. Steve sent 2.2 Bitcoin to Susan. I run that through an algorithm, SHA-256, and I produce hash B. The interesting concept is I can take both of those hashes, run those again through SHA-256, and I produce hash AB. The important thing to learn from this is that combining many different transactions into one that can be compared across computers can be done by chaining together different data sets. And there's actually a term for this. It's called a Merkle tree. And unless you're in the world of Bitcoin and cryptography, you probably haven't heard of this, but it's a very common term in, in this world. If you look at the bottom, you'll see four separate transactions. They all occurred, people exchanging money or contracts, whatever they're doing. Each one of those gets hashed, hash A, B, C, and D. I can combine hash A and B into hash A, B. I can combine hash C and D into hash C and D. And then I can take the hash of the hash and combine them together to create what's called the root hash, A, B, C, D. Now what's important is I could have thousands of transactions all strung together into one unique identifier. And then I can check any other computer in the world can run that same transaction data and we'll get the same root hash. So let me explain to you how that's used in blockchain. If you look at blockchain, you have something called a header and you have something, you have the transaction data itself. And in the header is the root hash. Remember the Merkle tree all the way up to the top, the root hash of all the transaction data. And that's important because that makes it easier for me to compare large data sets across different uh, computers, different databases. And that's what a block is. What is blockchain? Well, if you look at the top, you'll see a block, a single block. I've got the root hash of that transaction data. I have all of the data itself. And then I have the hash of the previous row. And when I combine two blocks together, then I know that those transactions are related to each other. And if any of the data changes on either of those transactions, I know that this is an invalid ledger. And what happens is you link together every block of a database all the way back to the original transaction that ever happened in that database. That's called the genesis block. And I take the root hash of that. So quite literally, anyone running Bitcoin will have a ledger on, a, on their computer, in their storage, linking any transaction that has literally ever happened in the entire history of Bitcoin. And that's what a blockchain is. A block is simply data. A blockchain simply links it together so that you know the entire database of transactions is valid. So let me now talk about centralized versus decentralized. 
If you look on the left-hand side, you have a store of value. I go to the bank, I give bank the bank my money, they are the custody of my money, they keep it safe for me, and there's something called remediation. Remediation means if they lose my money, there's consequences, they have to pay me. So I give them my money in exchange for custody and remediation, and they are required to do something called KYC. KYC means know your customer. They're also required to do something called AML, which is anti-money laundering. Why are they required by the government to do KYC? Is we want to make sure that we are cracking down on illicit activities, on the mafia, and more importantly these days, on terrorist activities. So that's how store of value works. Transfer of value is when I want to take money that I'm in possession of and obviously transfer it to other people or buy things with credit. And I still have these third party intermediaries between businesses I wanna spend money with or other people. In both of these cases, store of value and trans, uh, transfer of value, historically there's a central authority that controls your money. The goal of Bitcoin of cryptocurrencies is to get rid of that and to decentralize it. So remember we talked about these peer to peer networks like Napster, like Skype, like BitTorrent, a bunch of computers that come together without a central authority telling them how to transfer data. In, in this case, we do the same thing with the exception of the fact that we're trying to store money and transfer money. So each of these nodes on the network has a database attached to it. That database is the ledger. It's every transaction that's ever occurred. And each one of them has to verify that their ledger is accurate. So new transactions are constantly being added by the system. And every 10 minutes, a new block is created. A new set of transactions is added to every ledger in the system. The problem is, how do I get these distributed computers without a central authority to agree which transactions are valid? And that's what I want to cover next. You've heard of a concept, I'm guessing, called mining. Mining is the process of us agreeing which transactions should be added to the ledger. I take all the transactions of the last 10 minutes, there could be thousands of them, and I hash them all together as I explained to you through this Merkle tree. And I run it through an algorithm, SHA-256, to get an output of fixed length. Now here's the catch. I'm told what the answer needs to be. So if you look at the bottom, let's say that I'm told that whatever hash I produce has to have five zeros at the start. That's the goal. Well, how do I do that? How do I take a whole bunch of transaction data, run it through SHA-256, and produce a hash with five zeros at the front? There's literally no way to game it. The only way to do it is to run a transaction, add it to the transaction data, and see if, it, if I get the result. So I ran one, two, three, four, five as this thing called a nonce, which is a random data attached to my transaction data. And if I take the transaction data plus this nonce, which is just a random number I come up with, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, and then I check, did that produce a hash with five zeros on the front? And almost certainly the first time you run it, it will not. So then you create a second number, one, two, three, four, six in this case. I add that to the transaction data. I run it through SHA-256 and I say, did that meet the results? In that case, it didn't. And I just keep doing this thousands, tens of thousands, millions, billions of time until somebody in the system somewhere just gets lucky and randomly produces something that meets the goal, and in this case, five zeros at the front. There's no way to game it. And that's why this concept of proving that you're doing all this work and verifying transactions is called proof of work. But guess what? The people who solve this actually get huge financial results, uh, financial rewards, and therefore people are incentivized for doing this. So in the early days of Bitcoin, 
there weren't a lot of people connected to this peer-to-peer -peer network, so it was kind of easy to solve for the nonce. They might have said it had to have one zero at the start or two zeros at the start, and there weren't that many people competing for it, so I just put my computer in my college dorm, or maybe I set up a little web hosting facility, and I solved for the nonce, and the financial reward itself was pretty small. Over time, people realized I could put more CPUs, central processing units, and I could solve for the nonce faster than people who just had a crappy old computer in their dorm room. So I started winning more of the rewards. As the value of Bitcoin grew over time, as the economic rewards grew greater, people started pushing more and more CPUs in and they were making a lot of money. So people who didn't have a lot of CPUs were losing out. But then a bunch of smart people realized that, wait a second, GPUs or graphical processing units were faster at calculating this mundane transaction of solving for the nonce. They were faster than CPUs. So people started building specific computers optimized around certain types of GPUs. And because they would, on average, solve for the nonce faster than other people, everybody started creating these super GPU computers and earning more money. So along come these people and say, well, wouldn't it be better instead of a GPU and a computer if I designed an ASIC chip? And that's a chip, it's hardware specifically designed to solve for the nonce. And so what you had, what you can see is an arms race as more and more money was at stake if you won this competition, this lottery to solve for the nonce. As more people did that, people create an arms race where better and better technology was applied to this problem. And in many ways, it also supports people in low cost countries like China or India where they, their cost of energy is cheaper. Because to do all of these computations, to constantly be processing numbers, it not only takes computer power, which I have to spend money on, but it takes electricity to do all of the calculation and I have to pay for bandwidth and web hosting. And because there's a real economic cost for me to solve for this equation, uh, that's how you get some of the value of what Bitcoin actually is. Uh, if you look at what Bitcoin is at the uh, outset of 2018, you got about 12 and a half Bitcoin if you were the first person to solve this equation. That's worth about $150,000. So that is the economic incentive. Now here's what's interesting is as I run billions and billions and billions of tra transactions and I happen to stumble upon, get lucky upon this random number, the nonce, combined with my transaction to get the goal. And so I win the competition, I get paid. Now other people need to verify that I really won. How do they verify it? The way they verify it is they take the transaction data, which everybody knows, we saw it in the last 10 minutes. They take this nonce that I've, randomly figured out and I send that to them and they run it through SHA-256. And through SHA-256, it's super easy for them to verify. Remember, that's what we said about an algorithm. If I knew the answer, it's really easy to verify. So they verify and they say, yes, Mark won this competition. So what happens is I solve it, I update my ledger, I publish that I've solved it, the next person says, you know what? I ran it through SHA-256. I verified that Mark solved it. The next person adds it. And when more than 50% of the hash power of the entire system of a blockchain reaches agreement that Mark solved it first, that's what's called consensus. Consensus is the computers verifying the data have agreed on an outcome. And the greater than 50% hash power with consensus without a central authority, that's the concept of decentralization that you've probably heard people talk about with blockchains and cryptocurrency. So what should you know about Bitcoin? Now that I can pull out of the weeds and get out of hashing algorithm, it is a digital fingerprint because I've taken transactions or a transaction, run it through an algorithm that you can't reverse engineer so if I transfer it from me to Bob, I know that that transaction, if I've uh, confirmed it, that I can't solve that money, I can't spend that money twice. That's incredibly important in creating a currency. 
Right now, you need to understand that Bitcoin, as of early 2018, is mostly gold, meaning a store of value. It's impractical for you to buy a $3 cup of coffee uh, with your Bitcoin because of the energy use, the transaction fees, the latency, and importantly, the lack of price stability of Bitcoin. Uh, in a fiat currency like the US dollar, when I go buy a $3 cup of coffee, I can pretty much assume the next day it's gonna cost me $3, $3, $3, $3. And through inflation over time, that cup of coffee that I'm buying, the currency itself price changes. But in this case, three to 4% per year, Bitcoin at some points was changing 15% per day. And you can't have a transaction oriented system where the prices are changing that quickly. In the future, there will be more kinds of coins created. And it's very possible that you'll see cryptocurrencies with more stable value, which will allow more transactions to take place. So what is Ethereum? What are altcoins? And what is Internet 3.0? So Bitcoin, as I explained, is a store of value of money. Ethereum, as I started to talk about, is really about software talking to software. So I'm going to spend some time on why that's important. I want to leave you with three thoughts of Ethereum, at least as of early 2018. Number one is Ethereum today is the most scaled platform for people to do these kind of software to software interactions. Ethereum, as of early 2018, has the largest developer community building applications on top of it. And that itself is powerful. Number two, it differs from Bitcoin as I explained because it's more about software talking to software. And therefore point number three, it could emerge. It's not certain it could emerge as the dominant platform for what people are calling dApps, D-A-P-P, dApps. That stands for distributed applications. And I'm going to spend time describing why that's an important concept. Let me start with how the world works in a centralized system. And I just want to use the case of Dropbox. So Dropbox raises a bunch of venture capital, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of dollars. They invest dollars into servers and they store your document. And they spend all this money up front hoping that over time they get enough customers that not only can cover their monthly costs, but earn them a profit. So they spend money up front, they invest in servers, they build a system, they wait to see if customers come. If they become the dominant platform, then they have the opportunity to yield outsized profits because it'll be very hard for another player to come in and make those same investments. So to give you this example of how would you create Dropbox if you were going to create it today without raising a bunch of venture capital, without being a central authority controlling everything, you would incentivize a bunch of servers in a peer-to-peer -peer network to put computing resources and storage resources into the cloud. You would create a coin. That coin would incentivize people for doing these transactions. If your system, if you acquired enough customers that your system became valuable, then you'd get an arms race of people building better servers, better storage, and your network overall would become value. Now, the value may not all accrue to a central authority, like in the case of Dropbox. It may accrue to the network participants themselves. And this is a very powerful concept that we're going to go through in a moment. So what is an ICO? What is an initial coin offering? Well, if you think about these distributed systems, these distributed networks like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, if you think of them as systems that incentivize people to put network resources and incentivize people to be developers creating applications on top of them, you need a way of distributing value to those people for participating. And that's what a token does. People call them coins. Some people hate the word coins and they only want tokens because coins get confused with fiat currency. But if you think of them as tokens that are an incentive, you raise a whole bunch of incentive tokens to hand out to people so that they participate in your network. You need to be careful of any ICO 
that you're looking at, if people are raising money through this structure and it's not designed as a token to hand out to network participation, it is simply crowdfunding. And they may as well be using a different mechanism. And they are highly likely to be regulated by the US government. So I would encourage you to be thoughtful. I'm looking at an ICO. Is there a reason this token needs to exist? Is it incentivizing network participation? If no, this is purely crowdfunding. So in a DAP world, in a distributed application world, life becomes harder. Because as an investor, if I look at the left side of the screen, am I investing in the company? Am I investing in equity? Or am I investing in the tokens, the blue things on the right? If the tokens are what's accruing value, then what purpose of investing in the company? And then if you look at token ownership, when the company does the ICO, they themselves own a bunch of tokens. So how do I think about that? Am I owning part of those tokens? Am I owning equity? A lot of these issues haven't been worked out. These are the issues we as a community are debating right now. But here's how I think about it. On the left side, if you have equity, one negative of equity, sometimes a positive, but negative is it's illiquid. I invest in an asset, I can't get my money back anytime soon until there's a liquidity event. But it's relatively stable. There's not huge valuation fluctuations. Uh, the price of that equity tends to change at fundraising events, so call it every 18 months. The governance and shareholder rights are pretty well established. So I know things like management lockup due to stock agreements that have existed for a long time. So equity is predictable and understandable. If I look at the right-hand side, tokens themselves can be very liquid. Now there's a positive to that, which is if I invest in something with liquidity, I can get out easier. Uh, it makes it a little bit more an advantage for someone who's already a trader, like a hedge fund, than for a traditional investor, like a venture capitalist. But there's potentially huge daily price fluctuations, even if the value of, let's say in this case, as I talked about, this document storage system hasn't really changed much, the system may be going up and down uh, on a daily basis. And there's also a potential moral hazard. If I found a company and I can raise a bunch of money, but I haven't really built a well-established system, and if I can get liquidity and I don't have lockup, what happens in that world? And I think we're seeing what's happening in that world is you have a lot more scammers than you otherwise would. And you have the SEC getting involved now having subpoenaed uh, a large number of ICOs and for a reason. Doesn't mean this world isn't gonna exist. It just means we need better governance of it over time. So we're, why are altcoins created and what are they? So as of early 2018, the emergence of Bitcoin and Ether represents over 50% of the value, over 50% of the value of all cryptocurrencies. So there's effectively two big cryptocurrencies and everything else. There are other companies creating new coins, new ecosystems, which are known as altcoins. I list some examples, Litecoin, Monero, Ripple. And altcoins can either be built on top of Ethereum that was, remember, I talked about the use case of Ethereum was launching ICOs. Or you can create your own new blockchain. Now, there's a bigger hurdle because you have to figure out how to create the infrastructure of blockchain. But there are many companies who thought Ethereum has flaws in it. I want to build a better mousetrap. And there's a positive to that because if you get it right, you'll be significantly more value, valuable. There's a negative to that, which is... I've got to get this network effect of developers who all want to build on my system and everyone's competing for developers. So whether altcoins become valuable or not will be determined by whether or not they can attract developer audiences to build on top of the platform, which is why many of the smart people I know today are super bullish on Ethereum. Why do people refer to blockchains as Internet 3.0? What does that even mean? Let me walk you through what Internet 1.0 was. 
When the internet emerged, there was a series of standards. They were de facto standards. These weren't things that were created by an individual company for commercial gain. The ones you'll know, HTML, the hypertext, mark, hypertext markup language, HTTP, TCP, IP, these govern how we transfer information between computers on the internet and how we display information on screens on the internet. Now, there was a day where AOL was out there and they built something called a walled garden, which is you felt like you were on the internet, but you weren't really on internet, you were on AOL. And it's interesting to me that in the 90s, there were a number of people who thought you really couldn't compete with AOL because they had better content, more money, more revenue, more uh, users, and that walled garden of content would always be the open internet. But we know that isn't what happened. What happened was you had these companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Apple, they built on top of these open protocols and they were able to marshal in all the resources of the distributed internet, of developers, of user community, of different applications that worked on top of their system. And they were able to build incredibly large businesses. And that's what people called Internet 2.0 or Web 2.0, where these large companies created on top of open internet protocols. But along the way, these open companies decided they didn't want to be so open. There was a time at which you went to Google and the only objective was to then get launched off onto another page. Well, now you know when you go to Google and you type flight information, they try to keep you on the homepage by displaying flight information. You want restaurant information, they're gonna give you restaurant reviews. You want movie times, they're gonna give you movie times. And their goal is how do I monetize my users as much as I can? They're not really supporting the open internet like they used to and Facebook, started by allowing all applications to be built on top of Facebook, but increasingly has tried to control that platform. And there's a problem with this. There's a problem with this that we're starting to fully appreciate in 2018, which is these big companies have a lockup of some really important foundational things that make it difficult for new companies to be created. And we know we want innovation because innovation equals progress. But if the big companies are able to control these important attributes, you may not actually see the same innovation going forward. So things like user identity. Is this the person I think it is? Is Mark Schuster Mark Schuster? How do I verify that? I might ask him for his email address. I might ask him for his mobile phone number. I might ask for a response. But once I verify him, I have user identity. I might, might know this person's bank details by knowing bank details on Amazon, on Apple, on Google, on Facebook, I can in a single click push a button and purchase something. And reducing purchase friction allows you to purchase a whole lot more. It sounds good. In a way it is good for consumers, but it creates a competitive advantage that's really hard for new startups to compete with because they have to ask you for your credit card. And it turns out that when a person has to get out their credit card, many people abandon that process. So they are at an advantage. These organizations like Facebook, they have my social graph. They know who I'm connected to. They know who I communicate and how frequently. They know who's close to me. And when they know that, that social graph, it's really my social graph. It's the people that I interact with. I can't then walk over to another system and say, you know what, I'm tired of Facebook. I'm gonna take my social graph to this other product because the social graph is controlled by and locked into that platform. Reputation. If I do a transaction on eBay and every time I do a transaction, I fulfill the obligation quickly and so I get five stars, let's say, or I ride an Uber and I get five stars, my reputation is bound within each product I use and doesn't accumulate to create reputation for me across the web. And the interest graph, if there's a period of time, let's call it 18 months where I'm doing a lot more searching on baby strollers or a lot more searching on baby monitors or a lot more searching on how to breastfeed, whatever my topic is, that interest of mine, whether it's a permanent interest because I'm a doctor or whether that's a temporary interest because I'm about to become a new parent, that is 
my interests, but they're locked in platforms. And the important thing is that gives these big companies huge, huge competitive advantages to new startups. And that's what people are trying to solve. They're trying to say as a society, do we want a world in which Apple can tax any application that wants to be distributed through an Apple iPhone by 30%, where Google Play can tax any application by 30%, where Apple can decide, you know what? We don't think fart jokes are funny. So anyone creating an application with a fart joke, we're not gonna approve. Well, it turns out I don't really like fart jokes either, but I like a world in which if people like fart jokes, they can appear and I don't have a central authority like Apple telling me that it's good or it's bad. Facebook decides whether or not they wanna promote media. Well, it's their platform, so I guess they get to make that decision. But in a world where they have two billion users and they control our social graph and they control how people access information, they get to play kingmaker and decide who can make money, how much money they can make, and how much Facebook itself is gonna make. So these are really the issues of our times. These are the issues we're uh, arguing about and the hope, it may not happen, but the hope of people who want to see distributed applications emerge are the people who want to unlock these things that are ours, identity, banking, reputation, social graph, interest graph, return them to us and allow us more portability. In the same way when you have a mobile phone, you want your phone number to be portable, otherwise you're always stuck with that existing mobile operator. And that's the world that people are uh, starting to uh, imagine it existing. So what are some of the problems that still exist? Problem number one is that blockchains are not showing signs of scaling very well. So this idea of tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of computers all competing for processing information and transactions, turns out it hasn't scaled very well. And so there's new technologies being developed. In this case, I've listed what people call them. They call them side chains, or sometimes they call them level two or layer two networks. All this means is all of the transactions that were happening on blockchains that are not scalable, people are pulling them off the blockchain and say, what if I did some side processing over here to speed up how blockchains work, and then I'll put the data back in the blockchain when I've uh, finished with that. There's a whole bunch of innovation happening on side chains and layer two, level two networks. Number two problem is how centralized is your hash power? Now you'll remember I told you in a blockchain network with decentralized application and no authority deciding whether or not the blockchain gets updated. It's decided when consensus is reached, more than 50% of the hash power of that network. Well, what about if state actors step in and they use their almost unlimited resources to create their own server farms so that they can control the hash power of something like Bitcoin for strategic reasons? What if Russia did that? What if North Korea did it or China? What if the United States did it? So this idea of decentralization only works if the hash power itself is decentralized. And so there are now litmus tests by network to say how centralized or distributed is the hash power, and therefore, is this likely to be a blockchain that will exist in the long run? Number three, it's one thing to have a trustless transaction. I'm sending money back and forth between you and me. It's another thing when two software pieces of software code are interacting with each other. If I don't trust you and I'm sending you $10 or receiving $10, that's one thing. But what about if the software that I'm interacting with is fundamentally nefarious? And that actually is happening. I listed just one example, the Dow project. And the Dow project had a software wallet with a bug in it. And as a result of that, a hacker found a way to exploit the bug and remove $50 million from the system because of poorly constructed software. If I'm interacting with a business like Amazon or Bank of America 
or Verizon, and they make an error that costs me millions of dollars, that's where the topic of remediation comes in because I have a contract with them that says they have to make good on their error. But there's no such luck in a trustless system. So this is something we're going to have to learn to how we verify the trust of other software we deal with. In an unbundled ICO world, in which I have blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and ICO, wh what do I do to stop management from launching the ICO and leaving four months later with $10 million from the project without delivering any value? So we need some legal governance and oversight into the ICO world. Uh, the, remember, I said at the very start, you have to think about who the individual actors are and what their incentives are. If I'm an anti-authoritarian, anti-authoritarian person, then I don't want the SEC involved in any circumstance because I just assume all government is bad. Well, the truth is, without the SEC oversight, you're going to have hucksters. You're going to have sham. You're going to have people marching away with other people's money. So uh, government is imperfect, but no government is anarchy. And so there is a role to be played by some group, the SEC, for uh, oversight of these networks, and that's something that hasn't been fully solved. We're lacking mechanisms to enforce governance and world order. So in a world in which I can have transactions, uh, I'll give you an example. There are a number of white supremacy groups in the United States that historically have a hard time raising money and spending money because the systems that are set up, the banks themselves, the payment processors uh, are reluctant to work with these groups because they're required to have KYC, know your customer, they know these groups and they're reluctant to work with them. They certainly are required to crack down on perceptions of terrorist organizations. That's why there's a $10,000 daily limit of money you can transfer across institutions without being put on a government database to slow down the spread of nefarious actors like the mafia, like terrorists from spreading money. Well, in this world where we're using cryptography to make this all anonymous, it has been easier for some of these groups to raise money and to spend money. And that's something that we're gonna have to grapple with. Governments are simply not gonna tolerate totally anonymous transactions taking place. So where are we? as a system. I've drawn a graph. The y-axis is, call it euphoria or value, and the x-axis is time. And we're somewhere where I've kind of written, we're somewhere here, where there's been the last three years, 2015 to 2018, has been this huge growth of euphoria and value and economic gains. Undoubtedly, there's going to be a correction because the price appreciation of the assets that we've seen have risen so fast without the underlying transactions. It's like the value of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all these networks are so valuable without real people really using them. It's not changing people's lives today. But what I suspect is that this world of decentralized applications that we're building, even if it takes 10 years to develop applications that we can't even imagine today, that these will end up being even more valuable in the long run than when we are today. We've seen this before. We saw this with the overinvestment that went into wireless, the overinvestment that went into Internet 1.0, the overinvestment that went into cable, the overinvestment that went to creating competitive telephone companies. But every time we've overinvested in this euphoria phase, when the ashes have cleared, we've seen a growth of even better, more powerful businesses. So I suspect, even though some of you may hate that there's all this hype and all this value creation, I suspect that in the long run, you're going to gain from that. So thank you.